Welcome to this week's installment of BSO Backstage, a concert preview. I'm joined with, of course, Dan Alcott and Laura Clemens. Welcome. Great to be back. <laughs> so, uh, before we get into the last concert, how about that social? I mean, there was a lot of buzz about the, the concerto from the celloist, and there was a couple of different uh, performances that evening. Well, it was really a fun week. We had uh, Mark Kosower in town. Mark is the principal cellist of the Cleveland Orchestra, which is my favorite orchestra in the world, the best string section in the world. A lot of people in my business would agree with me, except for the people in New York Philharmonic. Um, but uh, Mark, has, this was his third appearance with the Bryan Symphony. My first concert, he was our soloist in 2003, and I've invited him to come back a few times, and each time it's, the scheduling has gotten more difficult because his career has just <laughs> kept going. And he, it was, yeah, it was so great to have him back. I've known him since he was 18, and he's just a wonderful cellist, and I'm a cellist, you know, so it's a little bit of a guilty pleasure, as were you, mm. right? Yes, like yes, I was, I was a young cellist. Yeah, <laughs> but anyway, Mark, uh, in order to kind of make it worth his while and, and to really enjoy his presence, he had to take a, a week's leave from the orchestra, which he's granted several weeks, and he gets to go out and play concertos and solos. Uh, we arranged that um, through the Center Stage series at Tech that he gave a recital on Thursday night, which was unbelievable. I mean, people, uh, there was a good crowd there, and it was, it was almost, it was as exciting as the concerto was on Sunday, but just to see Mark and his wife, Ji Wan, uh, is a pianist and she accompanies him, and the, the relationship that they have on stage, it's so special to see people who just, you know, think together, and they're used to playing all this very difficult literature. Um, it was really great to see him. And then Mark was uh, kind enough, well, he didn't actually know that, but we had this great social at the uh, CPAC, at the Cookville Performing Arts Center, uh, in the lobby, and I had planned to have my university uh, cello ensemble play a couple things, kind of just to entertain Mark. And during the day, one of the kids had uh, had a conflict come up. I couldn't be there that night, so I called Mark at the hotel to see if he wouldn't mind just sitting in with us. And he was down in the, the conference room at the hotel practicing, and uh, G1 said, but he'll play. And so uh, I brought a cello, unbeknownst to him, he showed up and I'd brought my, my extra cello and he sat in with us on a couple of tunes. And it was just really a fun environment and a beautiful environment too, to be there at CPAC in that beautiful lobby. Um, and some people who were at the social hadn't been there since the remodel anyway, so that was a great thing. We really appreciate Chad McDonald um, having us, you know, hosting us there. It was really a fun uh, way to spend an evening and also get to talk to, to Mark about his career a little bit. Um, so people who ended up then coming to the concert, you know, it's a great thing about our, our soloists here in Cookville, and they know this, they keep coming back, obviously, some of them, um, that it's a, you know, you kind of get to build a relationship with some people and you get to see them a few times, and, uh, and it's not so big a hall that when you uh, sit down on the stage, you, you, you recognize people out there, and that's a great feeling. And speaking of which, um, I, we have some friends over at the Fairful Inn where he was staying that was um, talking about, you know, hey, there's this cellist in the in the lobby playing, and it's it's really cool um, when you're setting up those partnerships and uh, making sure that the guests have a wonderful time. Wh what do you look to make sure that they succeed at that? Mainly a lot of contact that they know that they can call us at, at any time and make sure that they they're taken well care of. Fairfield Inn has been remarkable for us. They, they love that environment, that's, that's for sure. Mark is used to that, you know, when you're a cello um, soloist on tour, you don't want to bother the people you're st in the room next to you. <laughs> so frequently when you check in, you say, you know, can you put me on the end or I need to practice it sometime. And I think it was the people at the inn who volunteered and they said, nobody's using the conference room this weekend. You can just practice in there. And that was really nice because that's a nice, a bigger room for Mark to, to play in. And he felt, you know, because I had said, well, if you want to come over and use my studio, you can come over and, you know, practice at the university. But that was great for them. And, and um, they just enjoyed having a quiet, he and his wife enjoyed having a quiet weekend in Cookville. And uh, we, we went to uh, Cinco Amigos for dinner one night and it just got to kind of hang out. Uh, and it was really, really fun. And he taught a master class uh, for some students early on Thursday morning. Um, cello master class, and that was really inspiring. It was very inspiring for me. On Saturday afternoon, I, I got to have a lesson. He didn't call it a lesson, but he said, sure, you can play for me. So we played and we talked about, we have the same teacher, so we talked about things, technical things. It was, you know, like I said, a little bit of a guilty pleasure for me, but that's okay. Everybody else enjoyed his stay too. And the performance that you did with your students was something a little different, a little outside right. the box. <laughs> we have a piece that, that I kind of trot around one of my students 
um, it, it, it's, you perform it with a beat box. So we have a, uh, in fact, I have a Memorex Cube, you know, that I can plug into my iPod and there's a beat track that was actually a remix of a lecture, a psychology lecture at Tech, and it's called Ability. And so it's for beat box and five or six cellos. And uh, so that was fun. And, and I told Mark the great thing about, you know, coming to Cookville is that he got to play a piece of music that he has never played before. <laughs> and he probably won't ever play again, but that was really a lot of fun. But he sat in uh, with us on that as well. All right, Ann. Um, so let's talk about the concert. Um, you know, packed house, and it, it was nice to see the cello featured. Well, the cello is the world's best instrument. <laughs> so Not that we have any bias right? or anything. <laughs> um, yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, Laura, we were sold out for Weeks. Days. <laughs> weeks. No, it was weeks. <laughs> and we had the great thing is we had, um, you know, a lot of people in our audience know mm -hmm. that if they turn in their tickets, mm -hmm. you know, if they're mm -hmm. not able to be there, and we have some snowbirds in February, um, then we get to resell those tickets for mm -hmm. people who really want to see the concert, and mm -hmm. that's super important. We keep uh, a wait list of at least 60 to 70 people this season. It's For October, it was over 100 mm -hmm. people waiting to get tickets, and so when people release them, then we're able to accommodate those folks who are dying to see the concert. It's, um, it's, our, our people are very conscientious, conscientious about that. They, and it's great. Like people just need to call in, and they can do that's that. All just they remember have to, to do? call the office. Yeah. They don't have to bring their tickets in. Um, they just have to call and say, we're not going to be there. You can mm -hmm. release those tickets. Exactly. And in this case, it was great because we were able to accommodate, um, I think, almost everybody on the list. Well, absolutely everybody. And we yes. usually are. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's the important thing. People need to know it's okay you know, to be on the wait list. We're going to accommodate you. That's I right. had students from as far as Knoxville and uh, Chattanooga mm -hmm. fellow playing kids come mm -hmm. to see this concert because I warned their teachers. I said, you know, don't miss this. Some of them came on Thursday night and then on uh, Sunday afternoon to hear Mark play. Mm -hmm. So this particularly for me, that was great that we got to accommodate those young people who mm -hmm. want to see a great, great cellist. And uh, this was also dedicated to the namesake of the auditorium, James Wattenberger. What, what sparked that? For years, the orchestra has, has put on what we call Founders Concerts. And every February and March, we honor, at least we honor James Wattenberger, who founded the, the um, orchestra itself. And then the next month in March, um, the Derryberry family, Joan and Everett Derryberry, president and first lady of tech for 34 years, um, who helped make this possible, who, who supported Wattenberger as he created this, um, this orchestra. In March, we also have the winner of the Joan Derryberry Memorial concerto competition um, play. It was named in her honor for a, for a very good reason. She, um, as a youngster, a youngster, as a young, a young woman, she was able to play the Tchaikovsky piano concerto with the London Philharmonic, which was, she never forgot that, of course, um, and she always wanted to see kids get that opportunity again. And so every year we, we have this competition and, and we, um, they, they always play in March. What's the selection process for uh, the, de the competition is a departmental competition in the Department of Music, and the requirements are that um, each studio professor gets to forward one student into the competition in one area. So there's one, you know, oboe player can uh, play, one tuba player. Each, you know, a professor says the student is at that level. And usually we have about 10 or 12 uh, students that are, are ready to compete. We invite an outside jury. Um, to judge uh, the competition. And it's kind of, it's an open competition. It happens at night. Their friends and family come and watch them play. It's kind of like a concert, except for it's a little bit more edgy. <laughs> um, and uh, at the end of the night, the jury confers, and they, they choose the person that is most ready um, and um, will, will fill the bill, you know, the best, who's ready to play with a professional orchestra. And it's, it's neat. I was thinking about this this morning and reflecting on some of the former students um, now that I've been here 10 years, you know, who have won this competition. And it's really a special group of students. Um, some of them are performance majors, some of them are music education majors, but they've all been the type of people who are really willing to work hard and reach that level of excellence. And also understand that what we do as uh, musicians is we perform for an audience. And um, Tennessee Tech's department is really great about that because we, we teach a lot of music majors but we expect them to be able to perform. Um, if you're gonna go out and teach little kids or at a college level, et cetera, the, the idea of being a musician is, and you can be a shy person and still be a musician, but you can't be a shy musician. Um, and so the idea is to, to perform and share 
um, and connect with people all the time. And so we get these special people who win this competition who kind of fit that bill, who are able to express themselves in music. So, and this year's winner uh, is a percussion major named Constantine Vlasis, and he's going to play a concerto uh, by Sejourné, a French composer, um, for marimba and strings. Um, so it's a pitched percussion instrument. Um, and it's really going to be exciting. And Constantine is somebody who I've known uh, you know, since he came to tech. And he is a stellar performer. Um, he's going to join us at the Symphony Social on, on that Friday evening. And he's bringing a tambourine. He has a piece that's for tambourine that is quite exceptional. And uh, he's a real performer, and he gets it. Um, nice kid. He's from Chattanooga. He has a whole posse of people coming. I think as soon as he won the competition, didn't you get a phone call from his dad? For 20 seats. They <laughs> wanted to put aside 20 seats for, for the family and friends. Yeah, he wasn't yeah. sure who those 20 are, but <laughs> he knows he can fill those. <laughs> when can folks uh, finally get to see this young man perform? We're going to get to see two performances by Constantine. The first at our Symphony Social, which is a, um, a cocktail party kind of environment that we have before um, most of our concerts. It, it's a point. It's a chance for Dan to talk with the Cookville audience about what the what the concerts can be like. Um, this um, our March Social takes place at the home of Dr. Walter Derryberry, who is the son of um, Joan and Everett Derryberry, who we mentioned before. He and his sons are sponsoring um, the uh, the March concert, which we're very very happy about. It's very it's um, symmetrical. The idea of the the Derryberry concert being being sponsored by um, Walter. It's um, uh, for just a moment. Let me talk about the Derryberries a little bit. I, I think Everett and Joan. Um, who we know them as the president and first lady of Tennessee Tech for 34 years. You know, they, what they what they did for the university and the community, for that matter, was enormous. I think what we forget sometimes is that they were both musicians. They were both really, really good musicians. Everett, when he was 11 years old, actually toured with his church as um, as a tenor on the revival circuit, which I found amazing when I found that out. Um, he. He went to England, where he met his wife, met Joan before they were married, of course, and they they performed together in the Oxford um, University Opera Society. That's where they met it, in the opera that's chorus. Exactly right. They met it's, because they yep. were, the, I think, the same size. Yes, they and were the both And the person tall. who was doing the staging said, "No, no, no, wait, this isn't right. You two move over there." And he looked right. next to him and went, you know, "Exactly." So. I'm exactly. going to marry that girl and take her back to Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> so music was always in their blood. She was the a concert pianist, and he was, he was the, uh, the singer. And when they got here, they made a huge impact on the arts, in part, I think, because they, they needed it for themselves. They, Walter says that his mother had the soul of a musician, that she, she could not live without it. And so it became a, a bigger part of our community as a result of their influence and uh, something that we're still grateful for today. I think that was one of those things that Charles Bryan kind of put the first big footprint in this community in the 30s as a teacher of music at Tennessee Tech. And the, the Dairy Bears kind of took that you know, and expanded that and uh, increased that mantle. And, and you know, that's we're the beneficiaries of these people's uh, forward thinking. Um, at that point. So I also wanted to say that Walter can correct my story that I just gave when we go to the social. So if you want to know the real story about his parents meeting, in case I didn't get it right. Um, but that's a really neat thing to, to think about. And, you know, part of that was um, making sure that we had a vital department of music. So when um, Jim Wattenberger was then hired, you know, with that idea, then we, we started hiring this wonderful faculty. And one of the great things about this concert is we're, we have a piece that features seven of our faculty as soloists on the, on the first uh, half. We're playing a piece called Concerto for Seven Wind Instruments uh, and Strings by Frank Martin. So um, that'll be a great opportunity to, to really focus on that. In fact, I'm kind of taking it easy on them the rest of the concert because everything is for string orchestra and two pieces for string orchestra and soloist. So the Frank Martin has our wind faculty playing along with our percussion section. Um, and then we're opening the concert with a piece by Monteverdi because I don't think we do enough music from the 17th century. <laughs> so um, the great thing is uh, Monteverdi um, was one of the, he basically kind of invented opera. Opera really evolved, it, it wasn't invented. But what I love about having hearing his music is it's pre, it's the beginning of what we call the Baroque period, which is kind of where we start performing music from. Um, and it actually sounds more modern sometimes than, than modern music because music was conceived in a linear fashion originally. It wasn't conceived 
with harmony necessarily. You had lots of lines that kind of went together and that's where Baroque music kind of grew out of this uh, tradition. And it wasn't until what we would call the classical period where Haydn and Mozart and really harmony became you know, much more fundamental to uh, how we hear music. So I think it'll be great for the audience to hear this. Uh, this is um, s what's called Symphony and Ritornelli from the opera uh, Orfeo, which was the first opera. So there's no singing, but it's all the instrumental music. And um, the funny thing is the opening part is the music that my wife and I used for our wedding in 1991. So uh, that'll be, I'm sure that'll be really fun for Susan to hear that. Somebody should sit next to her and hold her down because she hears that music and she just has to march forward, you know, when she hears that. Um, but it's a great piece of music and I really, really love it. Um, then we're also doing a, a piece by a Czech composer uh, named Leos Janáček. And Janáček, um, this piece was written in 1925. It's a gorgeous string piece, it's a sweet. Janáček was a very interesting guy, also a big opera composer. Um, he's kind of the generation after Dvorak, and we just heard a piece by Dvorak on our last concert, so I thought this would be kind of a neat thing to hear, you know, what happened next in the Czech music world. Uh, beautiful work for strings. Janáček was a very interesting and private person, um, and he had a very long, uh, standing relationship with a young woman who was not his wife, um, all in letters, but um, she was his kind of his muse. And so uh, it's really interesting to hear, it's very intimate, but also emotional music that he, he writes. Um, modern in a certain way, but uh, beautiful and, and harmonic uh, music. And then we hear this wonderful piece by Sejourné for marimba and strings. We're gonna end the concert with that. It's a two movement work. It was actually written for a uh, quite famous percussion teacher at the um, conservatory in Linz, uh, Austria. And the uh, first movement is kind of a little bit more slow and rhapsodic, and then, of course, it's a percussion concerto, so the second movement has to have some fireworks and a lot of fun, and it'll just be a blast to both see and hear uh, Constantine uh, play this piece. That's a neat thing about percussion stuff. It's always viscerally exciting. Um, when we do a demonstration of instruments that are education concerts, the young people are very impressed when people start banging stuff around in the, in the percussion section. The marimba is the gentle giant of the percussion section. It's a five octave marimba that'll take up 15 feet on stage. Uh, and it's a mallet instrument that you, uh, a pitched mallet instrument that you strike um, different sized pieces of wood um, that make these pitches. And there are actually um, pipes below each of these um, pieces of wood. So it's kind of like if you think about a violin, that the string is the vibrating part and the box is the amplifier. It's the same thing with the marimba, that the pitched piece of wood is amplified by the tubes that are underneath it. So that'll be really neat for people to see. Not a lot of people have seen a marimba concerto. So we've seen one though, about six years ago, we had another winner on a marimba concerto here at the, uh, the Joan Derryberry Memorial Concerto Competition. And that's the one thing about percussion instruments. You, you don't think about all of the different notes that you can hit because it's just one uh, flat surface, but then it's it's the tempo which you hit it, it's the depth and how light you hit it. That's that's always interesting. Yeah, and you have these great categories of percussion instruments. You have pitched and non-pitched instruments. So this is a pitched instrument. You have what we call um, idiophones and membranophones. An idiophone is an instrument that the noise it makes comes from striking its primary material, like a cymbal. Okay, is made of a tempered piece of steel, and that's an idiophone. Anything that has a membrane on it is a membranophone, and that even means a non-pitched instrument like a bass drum has no pitch per se, um, it's really low. And uh, a tambourine has no pitch, but it has a, mem a membrane that you can hit, you can make different noises on it. It also has an element of a, an idiophone because the little um, tiny symbols that are on a um, uh, tambourine or, or idiophones. So it's kind of fun to get into these categories and, and it's interesting for me, composers have a great time uh, with it and in the 20th century the percussion instruments have really come to the fore and in fact at Tech we have an excellent percussion ensemble. They just performed at a national uh, percussion convention this year with support from the university and Eric Willey, um, the professor in the percussion area has done a great job, recruited a great studio. He's been here for probably seven years or something like that. And he has a wonderful group of kids and Constantine is one of those. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm always blown away by the, the ones that have the several different mallets oh, in yeah. their hands that can, I'm like, That'll be I fun for people to see. It's gonna be really, like I said, it, as well as sounding great, um, and Constantine is, would be a great performer. If he'd been a violinist, he just gets it. He gets music um, and he's, he's multi-dimensional. Um, so it, it's 
there's the curiosity of seeing the marimba being played. But if he wasn't a great musician, he wouldn't have won. Exactly. Um, so it, it sounds like there's a, a couple of different pieces from different eras and different genres all being in this one concert. Is there a single theme or a tie in between? The theme is that basically I was choosing, you know, I have to wait. When we had the, the concerto competition, I have to have the, the concert unprogrammed, basically, because I, have to, I don't know how long the winner's piece is going to be or whatever. So when that happened in uh, January, I start, then start working with the program. And I thought, well, this is neat because he's um, playing a piece for marimba and strings. I don't want to have a big, loud, huge orchestra piece right next to that because they don't kind of weigh the same. So I kind of started thinking, and I already had the Frank Martin piece for the faculty. I didn't want them to you know, blow their brains out all day in rehearsal and then have to play this concerto. So I thought, I thought I'll just do strings. And then I thought, why not put like 400 years between some of the pieces that are being played? So we have these, uh, we have a piece from the 21st century. The Sejourné was written in 2005. And then we have a piece from the 17th uh, century, which is the Monteverdi. So I did that just to be mischievous. <laughs> and um, also because that those pieces sound almost better together. I could have said, oh, let's do a Mozart, you know, serenade or something. I think these pieces actually sound better. So a lot of times it just has to do with, it's more important how things sound together than how they look. So. If I can, usually the theme comes afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited to see the show uh, March 24th. Um, Laura, how can people go about getting more information about the events leading up to the show, the concert, as well as the concert? Um, our website is always a great place to learn more about these events, and that's www.bryansymphony.org. Um, calling the box office at 525-2633 is a great way to get tickets. Uh, we, we're happy to make reservations for folks. and. Uh, Look out for the local media, Facebook, those kinds of um, opportunities to talk about this. We're always doing that. All right. Well, I look forward to the March 24th concert, and uh, we hope to see you there. And thanks for tuning in for this episode of BSO Backstage.